All right, welcome back everyone to another episode of Sierra School Prep Academy podcast. I'm your host, Jenny Fennell. Thank you for joining me today. So today we're gonna go over a pre-op assessment. Um, so I remember being an SRNA and being terrified of doing this. <laughs> um, so if that's speaking to you, know that I was there at one point too. Um, I'll never forget one of the first days I went over into pre-op to pre-op my first patient um, prior to going back to the OR. I fumbled over my words. I forgot what I needed to say. I only asked half the, not even half the assessment um, and had to kind of do the, the walk of shame back around to the patient and ask them more questions because I didn't want to seem unprepared to my CRNA. Um, so it definitely took me swallowing my pride and going back to the patient and then asking them the questions that I had forgotten to ask. <laughs> um, so Again, it's a painful thing to kind of get used to when you're not used to doing it. And, and if you're like me, you'll freeze up and be like, I don't remember what all I was supposed to ask. <laughs> um, so one thing that can kind of combat this a little bit and something that I should have had, but I don't really honestly remember why I didn't have this is having a, a piece of paper to look at as like kind of a cheat sheet. If you get nervous, just look down at that little cheat sheet and kind of help jog your memory on what else is you're supposed to ask the patient. Um, so that's just a little tidbit and pointer. So anyhow, so let's go ahead and get into the bulk of today's episode while I go over and give you guys kind of the rundown of how to do a pre-op assessment on your patients. Um, and one thing I kind of want to start off by saying as well, um, get there early because especially as a new SRNA, it's going to take you a lot longer to do this. And sometimes, again, you're not going to know everything to ask. Um, and one of the best things to come into work when you're a preceptor as a CRNA as having a student who thoroughly has already precepted or precepted thoroughly already pre-op the patient, meaning they understand their history. They know their lab values. They know what, what's in their past, what to expect. They kind of come up with a game plan themselves. Um, not that I expect you to do all of that on your very first day or week or even month of clinical, but I think that's what you should strive to do as you progress in your clinical training. Um, and cause again, it kind of hel helps the preceptor trust you that initial trust, like, okay, they did their due diligence and they really thoroughly researched this patient. They talked the attending, they have a game plan. They know everything of the risks associated with this procedure, as well as the patient history. It really just makes you kind of just feel super comfortable with the student. And trust me, you're going to get a longer leash. Um, I hate to say the word leash cause, but essentially when you're with the preceptor, you are on a leash. So, um, the longer leash you get, the more leeway you're going to have. And eventually you'll build that trust to where they just leave you alone. And that's like the beautiful part of being um, in a uh, trusting relationship with your preceptor is you tend, they tend to let you run more by yourself and make those decisions by yourself because um, there's that trust factor there. Um, cause remember as much as it's, it's kind of hard to, as a preceptor to let go, cause it's still their case. Um, and it's still at the end of the day falls back on them, their responsibility. So essentially it's kind of a big ask for someone to precept because it's, again, it's kind of like double duty. You not only have to do the case, but now you have to make sure that you're teaching and instructing and watching to make sure that things are, that should be happening are happening and that mistakes are not happening. And if they are happening, you have to jump in and help fix them or help the student fix them. You know what I mean? So, um, it can be, it can be stressful. Um, not gonna lie. Um, you know, having a brand new student is a lot of work, um, versus a very seasoned student who's maybe a senior in clinical is a lot more laid back in my opinion. Um, but we all start somewhere. So don't feel bad about it. I'm just putting it out there um, from a preceptor's point of view. And also from my time being a student, um, and I was, again, kind of like the shy, quiet one um, and scared. <laughs> but I also embraced that nervousness, that uncomfortableness is what I always encourage you to do to kind of embrace it. Um, all right. So first thing um, is the procedure and anesthesia history. So essentially, why are they having the procedure done is one of the first kind of questions you should be thinking when you're looking at the type of surgery that is taking place, okay? Um, essentially, what are their symptoms um, that's causing them to have this procedure done? And um, again, it, whether they've had any problems with anesthesia, have they had problems with general anesthesia before, um, trouble waking up like uh, nausea and vomiting, um, you know, if you're doing an epidural or spinal, it's always key to ask them, have you had an epidural or spinal before? And if so, do they have any problems doing that? It can really give you some great insight as to whether maybe they're going to be challenging for you, or maybe also helps you kind of troubleshoot what you can do differently. Um, for example, if someone had a hard epidural, you know, I, at first I do my own assessment because I want to see, okay, is this really, you know, 
I want to do my own assessment to see whether this is truly going to be hard. Um, and for those of you guys who are listening right now, I'm going to chuck my phone because I don't know how to silence Boxer. So I'm going to chuck it because I'm really annoyed that it keeps going off. <laughs> I don't know how to silence it. So hold on. All right. I landed on the jumpy house. All right. So back to <laughs> the podcast episode. Um, Yeah. You want to do your own assessment for like an epidural or spinal to kind of see whether you truly think they're going to be challenging or not. And, um, ask whether they have scoliosis, maybe ask too, like, was it one-sided or what made it challenging? Did they have to maybe go to a different level? Cause some people can have really bad arthritis. And so that makes their spaces tight. So knowing that you could also maybe, um, go a level up or a level down, depending on how you think the spaces feel, um, kind of helps you kind of, again, come up with a game plan. Positioning is always key with spinals and epidurals too. So it could have been bad positioning, Um, Maybe the patient didn't know how to really truly get themselves in the right position. So take extra time to help the patient get in the right position for those types of procedures. Um, And it also could have been, did they get a headache with an epidural? Okay, well, that's a wet tap. So maybe they're really shallow. So that's what I mean. Kind of trying to come up with your own conclusions as to how you can maybe avoid having those same problems they experienced last time. And same thing with like nausea and vomiting, or maybe they were slow to wake up. Well, maybe they're a lightweight. I mean, people will know they'll say, Oh gosh, it took me forever to wake up. You need to listen to that because that means you probably need to go light on the narcotic. Um, and you know, light on the versed, you know, there, there are people can be lightweights where they just take forever to wake up. Um, and you know, you don't need someone to not remember an entire week. You just need them not to remember the surgery. <laughs> so, um, use your best judgment when people tell you things like that. Um, and nausea and vomiting being pre preemptive, as far as treating their nausea and vomiting before it even starts is one of the best ways to prevent nausea and vomiting is to take those initial steps to kind of give them a scopolamine patch. Um, you know, maybe give them Zofran up front and Zofran at the end, give them the Decadron up front before incision. Um, you know, those types of things will really help maybe doing like a, a, a partial Tiva or a full Tiva, which is a total IV anesthetic is what Tiva stands for. And, um, you know, avoiding anesthetic gases altogether, you know, if it's, if it's a real severe, uh, history of nausea and vomiting. And so that's also why I tell my students, sometimes I don't necessarily even drop all my drugs before I go to pre-op because the game plan can change. You could have all the drugs and and you're ready to use anesthetic gases only to have to go back to your room and set up for a Tiva. Okay. So sometimes it's nice to kind of have everything labeled and ready to go, go see your patient and then come back to the room and make, and make sure that you drop the right drugs based on the plan that you're going to be doing that day. Um, so asking about family members, you know, any blood relatives who have had anesthesia problems and essentially what you're looking for here is MH malignant hyperthermia. Um, you know, that's the big one that you're really looking for. And, um, another thing to kind of consider too, for like these procedures is the age normal for this procedure. And that can essentially give you indications of their overall health. You know, I mean, as a 50 year old having a coronary, a triple coronary bypass, that's probably not, I mean, it probably means they have other lifestyle factors that are playing into it, a smoker, you know, or whatever it may be, um, severe, you know, just maybe high cholesterol and maybe they don't eat the best. I don't know. It just can kind of paint a picture for you to see whether this is a typical age range for a particular procedure or not. Um, and gives you kind of an overall picture of their health overall. Um, cardiovascular is a big one. You guys, um, you really want to find out whether they have cardiovascular history. Um, and keep in mind, there are a lot of people out there who just don't go to the doctor. So you can have people who are still very high risk who just don't know. Um, and that's actually one of the scary parts about anesthesia is you have to always essentially kind of treat people like they do have some kind of underlying cardiovascular disease that's not been discovered yet, especially when you have someone who's maybe in a high risk category, like a middle-aged man, um, a drinker, um, smoker, those types types of things. Um, keep that in mind that you need to be cautious of that because they may just not go to the doctor. They may not know that they have unstable coronary disease and, um, and maybe they haven't experienced chest pain yet, but maybe anesthesia is enough to put them over the edge. So you always want to be looking at like EKG strips. Um, if they have uh, actual EKG, that's great. Um, otherwise you want to make sure you're always getting a baseline EKG. I can't tell you how many times it's so annoying when you run out of paper, when you're getting ready to do an induction and you don't have paper and that, um, so check that, check your little, um, EKG strip printer and the OR before you start your case. It'll trust me. You'll thank yourself because it's frustrating when you need to print a strip and you can't, um, 
So it's always nice to get an initial baseline strip. Now, if you don't, if it is out of, if you're run out of paper and you're like, darn it, I forgot what Jenny said and I didn't check it, you know, just make sure you're always, usually they, they should print one in pre-op for you and make sure if you have any issues during the case that you're comparing what's going on in the case to what happened, what they got in pre-op. And that way you can see, okay, well, they've, they had a, a bundle branch block prior to going to sleep. So that's not new, but it's kind of, again, nice to kind of see, okay, they had PVCs prior to going to sleep. This is not, now they're in a, a tri or a bigeminy, you know, maybe they had several ect or ectopic beats in their pre-op strip. Maybe we should do a set of lights on them, electrolytes to kind of see if there's something off. Um, so that's, that's why you want to make sure that you're kind of evaluating their baseline based on then what you see in the OR. You want to always assess for changes. Um, and of course, blood pressure goes into that too. Make sure you keep their blood pressure within 20% of their baseline is ideal. Okay. Um, so again, do they have a heart problem? Are they seeing a cardiologist? Have they ever been told anything's wrong with their heart? Have they ever been told they have a murmur? Um, some patients just don't know. Like I had a patient who did have um, a right bundle branch block and he didn't, I discovered it after we put him on the monitor in the room, but in pre-op, he mentioned nothing about it. And then when I asked him about it prior to going, going to sleep, he's like, oh yeah, you know, they did say something to me, but they said it was nothing to be concerned about. So he just didn't think to bring it up because they had told him it was nothing to be concerned about, but he did have a right bundle branch block. But unfortunately we had no record of that ever being documented. And so we had to do an EKG and confirm that, that, you know, that it wasn't anything to be alarming before we actually went to sleep. Um, so that's the kind of stuff I'm talking about, um, whether they've had an MI in the past and then have they had a coronary bypass before because of it too. Do they have chronic hypertension, um, palpita palpitations or, um, you know, arrhythmias essentially like, you know, PVCs, that type of thing. Do they ever su suffer from shortness of breath and especially laying flat? Um, you know, that's a, it could be a good indicator of the reserve. So an important question to ask uh, whether they've had something like uh, rheumatic fever could give you maybe an indication whether they may have some kind of mitral disease, uh, valve, mitral valve prolapse. Um, and I'm going pretty in depth here, you guys, just so you know, but these are all things you should be kind of thinking about. And I'm not saying you have to ask someone if, they, if they've had rheumatic fever, but you know, if they, if you're suspecting of them having, um, you know, cardiovascular issues or maybe valve issues, you know, it could be something you can ask them. Um, you ask them whether they can do a flight of stairs without getting winded and have to sit down. Do they do things like housework? Can they walk a mile? Um, you know, always look for in their chart if they've had any past echoes or cath reports, stress tests, and whether they have had cardiac clearance. Okay, um, that's a big one. You you want to make sure you find whether they've had cardiac clearance, um, especially if they have a cardiac history. Um, you'd be surprised. Mo now, nine point eight times out of 10, they're going to have it. But I have caught several cases where they should have cardiac clearance and somehow they don't. Um, now, if your PAT pre-admission testing is on their A game all the time, you're probably not going to have an issue, but ultimately it's still on your responsibility. If they drop the ball to catch that prior going, prior to going back to the OR, you really need to have that cardiac clearance because if something were to happen on the table and the cardiologist never cleared them, well, you know what I mean? So that's just, you, you need to make sure that you're always covering your grounds and making sure these things are happening because the reality is, you know, pre-admission testing, it's, it's, it's a bunch of humans doing it and humans make mistakes, um, just as you make mistakes as a human. So you want to make sure you're always double checking and being like that third or fourth eyeball to go over their chart and make sure they have these things. Um, okay. And then we go into pulmonary, you know, do they have any breathing problems? Are they asthmatic? Do they have like, um, COPD or, um, some chronic bronchitis? Do, again, do they get shortness of breath with exercise? Have they ever smoked? Do they smoke marijuana? Do they vape? Um, vaping causes popcorn lung. Yuck. Um, if you're listening to this, I'm speaking to you. <laughs> don't vape. Um, don't smoke either, but, you know, asking them kind of trying to see what their, their respiratory reserve is essentially. And I'll tell you what, you guys having a respiratory cold, an upper respiratory cold of any kind is a huge ding, 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 red flag, because they are way more likely to bronchospasm on you, way more likely to have issues waking up as far as secretions and uh, mucus plugs and things like that. So you really want, that should set off red flags in your mind thinking, you know, maybe I need to give them some albuterol, you know, prior to going to sleep or 
prior to waking up, or maybe I need to do a good lavage, a little good pulmonary toilet for them <laughs> before I yank that tube out so they don't get a pneumonia afterwards. Um, being think thinking through these types of situations and just kind of knowing in the back of your mind that this makes it way more likely to have them uh, bronchospasm on you if they've had a recent respiratory cold. Um, yeah, whether they've had TB in the past, hopefully not. I feel it's pretty uncommon to see anything like that. Um, heart failure that can lead to pulmonary edema. Um, you know, you don't want to see pink frothy sputum in any kind of endotracheal tube, but you sure as heck would want to know if, if they have an underlying um, condition that would cause more likely to cause pulmonary flash pulmonary edema and obviously exercise extreme caution with that. Um, and then, yeah, like I said, asthma and what are their triggers for asthma would be great. Uh, last attack. Some people will list asthma and then you'll ask them and they haven't had an attack for like years. <laughs> and so their inhaler is as needed and it's very infrequent. So and that's really not that big of a deal versus an asthmatic who literally takes their inhaler around the clock all day, every day. That's a much bigger deal. And trust me, if you have a severe asthmatic that is not well controlled, they should not be having surgery. Okay. Cases get canceled for this and it's not safe to take a severe asthmatic back to the OR and put a breathing tube in and induced anesthesia when it's not under control. So know that, okay. You want to make sure you're really dealing with that prior to going to, to surgery. Now, if it's a class one, if it's, if, it, if it's a case that has to go, obviously, you know, you have to, you have to go with it and do your best. But if it's an elective case, these patients need to be optimized prior to coming back to the OR. Um, are they on steroids? That's another good question because also if they're on steroids, well, now you might need a stress dose of steroids, depending on the case. Now, if it's a trigger finger, okay, probably can do without the steroids, but for the most part, if someone's on chronic steroids, you want to make sure that if you're stressing their body with surgery, you want to make sure you're giving them a stress dose because essentially when you're taking steroids, um, outside of the body, you're suppressing your body's way to make steroids. And when you put your body under stress, you need steroids. So you don't have cardiovascular collapse. Okay. Um, and if you have a patient who's on chronic steroids and they start having some like hypotension and you start really struggling, really keep in that in the back of your mind, they may need a stress dose of steroids. Okay. Um, cause essentially that's what helps your body. That's the fight or flight, um, kicking in. And if you can't, you know, produce enough catecholamine surge to kind of help your body through, you may, you may again, suffer the consequences from that. Um, again, whether they're on home O2, if they're a COPD -er, and if so, how many liters, because <laughs> your goal, you guys, now it's not always possible, but my goal when I'm waking up someone with COPD on home oxygen is that I really, my goal is to get them on the same level of home oxygen prior to going to pack you. Okay. That's my goal. Does it always happen? No. Um, obviously they, they're going to spend an hour and pack you. So they would wean them down to their home level. Um, but that should be what you strive for to get them in a good enough respiratory situation, whether you reverse with Sugamidex versus Neostigmine to make sure all of their reserve and that they have in their body can go into breathing afterwards. You really want to try to optimize those patients so they can hopefully go home in the same amount of oxygen they came in on. Um, and plus they're also very easy to kind of spiral down into a, you know, bad situation where gosh forbid they have to stay intubated for some reason. So you want to make sure you're really optimizing those patients. Um, uh, let's see, do they, oh, sleep apnea. Sleep apnea is a big thing and it's a very common thing. And even patients who have it do not get diagnosed because again, people don't go to the doctor and I mean, I'm speaking that daddy, if you're watching this, I love you, but some people are afraid to go to the doctor and get diagnosed with it for whatever one reason or another, maybe it'll affect their ability to do their job or, you know, that kind of thing. So some people might probably have sleep apnea, but don't ever get treated or diagnosed. And it's a big deal in surgery because it can really play into how well they wake up from surgery um, and how long they spend in recovery. Typically they'll spend more time in recovery. Um, they're going to be harder to, you know, wake up from anesthesia because their, um, their body kind of doesn't regulate the right way with, uh, end tidal CO2, like their end tidal CO2 is usually high. Um, especially overnight, they kind of let, they kind of rest in a hypoxic state that causes pulmonary bronchoconstriction. It causes, um, damage to your heart. Um, patients with undiagnosed and untreated sleep apnea are way more likely to have a heart attack um, for that reason, because they spend all night hypoxic, they increase pulmonary pressures and strain on their heart. It can cause heart failure. So um, you really have to exercise caution with someone with untreated sleep apnea. I love the patients who come in and say, yes, I have sleep apnea. And yes, I wear my CPAP. I'm like, thank you. <laughs> You've just made my job way easier. I don't have to worry about you as much. Um, but 
more than not, it's people, even, even people who know they have it don't like wearing the CPAP. So they just don't wear it. And then, you know, so, um, and obviously if someone has sleep apnea, be prepared to have an oral airway, you will need an oral air airway more than likely, um, or a really, really strong pinky for a jaw thrust <laughs> to, to mass ventilate them. Um, all right, so let's go into renal, um, whether they have kidney problems, um, what's their creatin, what's their baseline, um, are they on dialysis, and if so, what's their last set of lights, um, especially you want to keep an eye on potassium level, that kind of thing. Um, also, if they are a dialysis patient, where's their graft at, you want to make sure you're not putting blood pressure cuffs on that side. Um, so that's probably sums it up with, and obviously no Toradol with kidney patients, um, may already be aware of this, but again, Toradol can actually, even for someone without kidney disease, um, if they're elderly, like, let's just say they're like 70 years old and you give them a 30 milligram, uh, IV push bolus dose, you can put them into kidney failure. So you, that's kind of a drug where it's a great drug. Don't get me wrong. I love it. It's a great NSAID. And we use it frequently. Um, however, you've got to be really, really cautious on how you dose it. 15 milligrams for someone who's over 60 years old is plenty. Um, and if they're over 80, I'd say just kind of avoid it in, in general because it's, you know, I'd, I'd rather go for like Tylenol or something like that. Um, you know, even though it's not that anti-inflammatory, it's just, it, it can be a dangerous drug if used incorrectly. Um, and also keep in mind too, if they're severe asthmatics to avoid NSAIDs. So Toradol is a no-no and a severe asthmatic. I should, should have mentioned that earlier. Um, hepatic, um, you're looking for things like jaundice, hepatitis, liver disease, alcohol abuse. Um, and that obviously should put off a red flag in your mind with bleeding risk, um, knowing what their last platelet level is. Um, esophageal varices is another thing too. They may not, you may, they might not even know, and you may not know, there might not be no documentation, but if you put down that OG for the procedure and hit a varice, that's a scary situation to be in. And people can bleed out very quickly if, if you hit a varice in someone's esophagus. So again, someone who is a, a alcoholic who we don't know whether they have a varice, I'd really exercise extreme caution and even ever putting an OG down. Okay. Um, you know, so if you need one, uh, maybe even see if the, you know, the surgeon would feel comfortable doing it under like visual guidance or something like that. Like we could always go down with like a scope, um, a bronchoscope to kind of see, is there any varices before we, we put down an OG? I know it seems extreme, but the other extreme is like them bleeding out in front of you. So, um, it never hurts to take that extra precaution to make sure, um, uh, whether they've had like, an, an, oh, let's go into neuro. So whether they've had a stroke before, you want to know what the residual is, meaning do they still have left side of weakness? A, a lot of people have had a, a small stroke and then actually get full, make full recoveries. And so there's no residual weakness, but you really want to make sure of this though, you guys, because if you're waking them up and then all of a sudden their right arm doesn't squeeze you as tight as their left arm, you're like, oh no, what if they had another stroke on the table? Well, what if that was their baseline? You know, um, So you wanna make sure you're knowing what their baseline is um, prior to surgery, um, whether they've had seizures. Um, a lot of people who have had strokes deal with seizures. Just There's also people who have never had strokes who deal with seizures. You wanna know if there's a seizure history in there. And if so, are they on medications for it? Um, and if, and then also knowing when the last dose of that medication is, do they need this medication in the OR? Um, making sure they're not getting behind on their seizure medications. Um, and again, you want to know like what causes the seizures that they do have tend to have, uh, like focal seizures or whatever they may, may be, ask them to ex explain and describe their seizures. So that way you can recognize it if it does happen during wake up. Um, okay. So we're going to go into GI. So with GI, you want to look, ask for like heartburn. That's a very common, especially in someone who's pregnant or, um, even someone who's overweight, who has a, a big belly, someone's going to have heart, high heartburn. Just think about the same thing as being pregnant. It kind of pushes, you know, your stomach up, um, you know, so you have uh, less control of your esophageal sphincter. Um, but so heartburn, you don't want anyone to aspirate during um, anesthesia. That's one of the big risk factors. And so that's why we ask patients if they've been NPO, um, which is also one of the first things you should ask a patient, whether they've had anything to eat or drink that day. Um, you be, believe it or not, people will still have coffee with cream, not thinking the cream is anything. And it is a thing. Cream is not clear liquid, so it can increase your, your bile production significantly. So cream's a no, no sugar's a no, no. Um, you know, so asking people whether they've had coffee with cream, you'd be, they'd be like, I haven't had breakfast, but I had coffee with cream. And so, um, 
might be worthwhile to maybe bump someone ahead of them in the surgery line of things and save them for afterwards if you can. Um, but yeah, back to gastro, um, heartburn, hiatal hernia, hiatal hernia leads, um, more likely to have reflux. And, um, you can also like to have, you have to sleep with your head up, you know, is it that, that bad to where if you lay flat, you feel like it comes up, um, ask them if they're currently experiencing any symptoms. They may be, they may routinely get heartburn, but maybe it's well controlled, or maybe they feel fine right now. Cause they haven't had anything to eat. Um, so they actually don't currently have symptoms, um, and making sure that if you're planning for an LMA, um, making sure you're, you're thoroughly evaluating how they currently feel. I've done LMAs with people with GERD. Okay. That's not contraindicated, but you have to assess how they're currently feeling. <laughs> you know, you don't want to put an LMA with someone with GERD who is actively having symptoms. If they don't have any symptoms and it's well controlled, well, it's there's, you can go ahead and use an LMA. There's nothing wrong with it. Just cause you have a history of GERD, um, doesn't mean that you can't use an LMA as long as you're currently not experiencing symptoms. Um, okay. So let's go into endocrine. You want to look for thyroid problems. Are they on any meds for that? Um, diabetes and how long have they been diabetic? How well controlled is it? Is their diabetes? You can look for like their A1C level in their chart. Um, do they take any meds today? If so, when, like you have to know when the last dose of, um, insulin was given, um, especially those who have like an insulin pump, um, you really want to make sure you're staying on top of them getting what they're, they should be getting and also keeping an eye on it back in the OR, especially if it's a longer case, you do not want someone getting hypoglycemic. That's very, very dangerous. If you're ever worried about that, just go ahead and get a bag of D five and just drip it in really slow to keep, give them like kind of a little bit of a baseline. Um, you don't want them to go to, you know, four or 500. So obviously <laughs> don't slam in a bunch of D five, but, um, you know, you, again, bottoming out with someone's blood sugar, it can be very, very dangerous. So keep a glucometer in the room, check it frequently, check it every hour, just during the case. Um, you'll be, you'll be thankful you did, especially if you're able to catch something that could have been turned into a bad situation. Um, all right. So that hits endocrine. Um, must like in a muscular skeletal skeletal the uh, <laughs> skeletal system, <laughs> whether they have like arthritis, um, like RA is kind of the one I look for rheumatoid arthritis. Um, you know, what joints are affected. Um, sometimes if you have severe arthritis, you may not even be able to lay flat and it may actually make your neck extension very difficult during intubation. So keep that in mind. Um, I always kind of assess their neck range of motion and also ask them if it hurts to move their neck. Um, if someone says, oh yeah, when I do that, I get numbness and tingling in my fingers, do not move their neck with intubation, plan for a glide scope, plan to, to stabilize their neck. Some people who have really severe arthritis can actually have like a pinched nerve. And so when they extend their neck, it actually can affect, um, you know, they they get like numbness in their pinky and their ring finger. Okay. So make sure you're asking about things like that. I've caught that several times. Um, where people don't think to say, does it hurt to move your neck up and down? Do you get numbness and tingling in your fingers with that? Most of the time it's a no, but every now and then it's like, yeah, actually I do. And I'm like, Ooh, okay. Well, I definitely don't want to move your neck, you know, at all. Um, so make sure you're asking that. Um, and also like, do they have MS, um, any kind of muscle disease that could put them maybe at higher risk for malignant hyperthermia. Um, so always asking about those types of things, um, whether they've maybe had ortho procedures in the past, they have any hardware, um, you know, again, what, and this could be even like for positioning purposes, like what's comfortable for you. If you can't lay flat, cause your back is, is wired because you've had, you know, seven, six laminectomies. Well, how can we make you comfortable by putting pillows under your knees, by keeping your head up? Like, what can we do? So making sure you're asking these things ahead of time. So you can get the equipment you need back in the room to make sure the patient can be comfortable on the bed. Cause think about it. If you lay on bed for four hours, uncomfortable, you're going to wake up uncomfortable. And I've had patients, you guys, if this is not done very well, that despite them having like, say their arm cut into, they wake up in severe back pain. And so it doesn't matter what they had done for surgery, their back hurts so bad. That's all they care about. So you really have to be aware of that and cognizant of making them comfortable before they go to sleep. Cause I promise you, if they don't go to sleep, feeling comfortable, they're not going to wake up comfortable. So, um, remember that. Um, all right. So psych psychiatric, whether they are on medications for depression, anxiety, um, sleep, um, and that will really play into how your drugs work. Um, and you know, some pa patients who already take, uh, like volume or something, you know, they're going to probably need a whopping dose of Versed to even have an effect. Um, you know, so keep that in mind too, with your anesthetic, um, that you may need to make some adjustments with that. Um, 
hematologic anemia, bleeding, whether they have any kind of like, I don't know, uh, von Willenbrand's or, you know, any kind of, um, sickle cell, or whether they're Jehovah witness, that's a big one too, whether they would take blood products. Some Jehovah witnesses will take albumin, but not blood products. It's always important to ask, you know, and if, you know, they don't know the difference, you can always explain it to them. Um, but, you know, make asking if they, if they say no to blood products, ask them if they'll take albumin. Uh, most of them will, will know um, whether they can accept albumin or not. And I would say the vast majority actually do, at least that's been my experience. Um, pregnancy, uh, this is one that people, I, it's easy to kind of like, oh, they're young, healthy, female, cool. But have you checked an HCG? <laughs> Check an HCG, make sure they're not pregnant, um, especially because if you're giving Versed, that can be, you know, especially if it's early on in the pregnancy, um, that can be harmful to the, to the baby. So make sure you're always checking the HCG. Um, you always want to ask them what medications they're currently taking and they could have a whole list of medications, you guys. Sometimes patients just don't update these lists and you don't know what they're currently taking. So it's still really important to say, what have you, what did you take today? <laughs> because you might narrow it down to like four or five meds and you have a list of like 15 meds. And some of them could have been old. Some of them, they may only take as needed. So again, it kind of helps to ask them, what do you, what did you take today? What are you currently taking? Um, and that's also really important for things like, uh, blood thinners, um, again, uh, any kind of insulin, um, those types of drugs are always really important to know exactly when they took them. Um, allergies, it may sound like a no brainer, but you don't want to forget about ask about allergies. Um, and then ask them what their reactions are. Like so many people will say, like, I have an allergy to, to Epi, for example, like, and it's because I went to the dentist and had uh, local injected and had a racing heart. Well, that's kind of not really a true allergy. Epi makes your heart race. It's kind of, and plus it's adrenaline. It's found in your body. <laughs> um, it's like when people say they have an allergy to potassium, but it's because the potassium burns going in, not because they're truly allergic to potassium. Cause again, that element exists already in your body. But again, people list allergies when they have reactions they don't like. So it's important to kind of differentiate between, is this a true allergic reaction or is this just a side effect they don't like? So therefore they don't want that drug. Like they don't you know, want to take this antibiotic because they get diarrhea. Well, that's the side effect of taking an antibiotic. It's not a true allergic reaction. You know, anaphylaxis, getting anaphylaxis is a allergic reaction or hives, you know? So that, those are the types of things you're really looking for and making sure you're asking. So that way, you know, not that you would still give them an antibiotic they don't want, but, you know, at the same time, you would know that if you could do a test dose of ANCEF to see whether they got hives, you know, versus you don't want to give ANCEF if their reaction to penicillin is anaphylaxis. I don't even risk it. There's a cross coverage of like less than 9%, but I wouldn't want to take that risk. So that's what I mean. You want to kind of gauge, um, you know, the severity of the allergic reaction they have to whatever it is. Um, whether kind of drugs, the frequency that they take and street drugs are included in this, whether they smoke uh, marijuana, whether they do Coke, whether they do heroin, I don't, you name it. I mean, I don't know. There's all kinds of stuff out there these days. You have to ask them, um, especially cocaine. I mean, cocaine can be very, very, very dangerous when combined with anesthesia. Um, you definitely want to make sure if someone has a history of cocaine, they've done a recent tox screen to see whether they're, they're clear to go. Um, and let's see what else, um, obviously weight, height, um, airway, this is probably, you know, again, one of the first things you're going to do is do an airway assessment. Um, people are shy. People don't really want to open their mouth and show you their mouth for whatever. I mean, I don't, I don't really blame them. I mean, I don't necessarily want to show people my mouth, but you know, people, you know, might, might go like this, you know, I'm like, can you open your mouth any wider than that? And a lot of times they will, or a lot of times they won't. And you're like, ah, what? you're just, you're just not going to cooperate. Um, but sometimes people really truly can't open their mouth that wide. So it's really important to kind of gauge whether, okay, are they being shy and they don't want to show me how wide they can open their mouth or do they really have a jaw issue where that's as wide as I get, <laughs> you know? So you want to really make sure you're assessing that and, um, the range of motion of the neck, um, and asking about the pain in their fingers with them, with the motion in the neck, um, but assessing their dentition, whether anything's loose, anything's chipped. You want to make sure you're noting that prior to going to sleep because you want to know whether you're responsible. You don't want to knock anything out. Um, you don't want to make, you know, an already chipped tooth even more chipped. <laughs> um, so again, assessing their dentition is really important too. An overbite could be an indicator that's going to be a harder intubation. Um, a really narrow palate can be a hard indication or an indication of a more narrow um, airway, uh, like just the palate if it's more narrow. Um, went over that dental issues. And then obviously NPO status, I kind of covered this briefly earlier, but 
um, you really own oh, the thyro mental distance. I forgot that the thyro mental mental distance. What that means is you take your fingers and you really want three finger breaths for a good thyro mental distance. I actually, I think I have exactly a three. And since this is going on YouTube, I'm going to show you guys, um, see how I have like three fingers. Um, so if you have two fingers, thyro mental distance, meaning from the tip of your chin to where you touch your neck, ow, I just banged my knee on the desk. On the desk. It means you're going to have a more um, anterior airway. If you have a one, you're going to have a very interior airway. I mean, some people, it's like their chin's almost connected directly to their neck. Um, you'll run into that um, and look for, I hate to say it, but guys with goatees tend to really hide the really tiny chin that way. And so if a guy ever has a goatee, I really investigate their thyromental distance thoroughly because it's usually because it's hiding the fact that they don't have much of a chin, not always. So by all means, if you have a goatee, I'm not saying that, but I'm just from my experience, what I found uh, to be true sometimes a lot. <laughs> Um, but so assessing their thyromental distance. And again, you really would like three finger breaths is ideal. Um, any more than that? Um, like if you have a four, um, or gosh, I've never, I don't think I've ever had a five, but I mean, I've had some big men before with giant, giant jaws. I just go up to a Mac three or, um, or, or not Mac three, a Mac four or a Miller three, just cause you're going to probably need some extra length on your blade. So just keep that in mind. And then lastly, the NPO status again, and making sure you're asking about the coffee and creamer because that's uh, a big culprit. It's funny around the holidays last year, uh, pre-op had hot chocolate stand, which is really nice, you know, for like visitors and stuff. But um, our patients were like, ooh, hot chocolate. <laughs> you know, so we had like four or five people in one day go drink hot chocolate before a, a surgery center case. And we're like... <laughs> take the hot chocolate stand away, <laughs> you know? So, um, you know, people, people don't realize people make, you know, make mistakes. So it's always key to investigate that. Cause the last thing you want is anyone to aspirate. So that's also very, very important. Well, I know it's threw a lot at you in this episode. I spoke really fast, to try to get through it quickly, but I hope you guys enjoyed and we'll see you guys next week.